All right, now we move to Article 3. This is the one that I'm calling the Dragon Cannon. The Dragon Cannon. It's draconian. I'm putting it up on the screen. It's a long one. It's going to take a little bit to unpack here. Let's see if it even fit. Oh my goodness, look how big this thing is on the screen. How am I going to handle this? Yeah, it's not going to fit. Let me if I move over here. There we go. I'm going to move over. Number one. The bishop... So Article 3 has these uh, subpoints, okay? Article 1, the bishop is to determine that these groups do not deny the validity and legitimacy, both two terms, validity and legitimacy of the liturgical reform dictated by Vatican Council II and the Magisterium of the Supreme Pontiffs. So now, it is not just that people say, hey, I want a Latin Mass, let's do a Latin Mass. Now the bishop has to determine the convictions, the beliefs of that community, which would be the priests and the lay people, regarding whether the lay people deny the validity and the legitimacy. See, many of us would say, yeah, it's valid. We accept that it's valid. But is it legit? Is it legit? Is there a legitimacy to it? Now, I think we can play with some some wordage here, and we could say, "Well, yeah, it's valid," and we could say it's legitimate in that it was stated by a council, or you could even just say, "Well, the text of Sacro Con Sanctum Concilium in Vatican II, I accept, but I don't accept the new mass." This right here is basically number one, giving the authority to the bishop to make a judgment and say, mm, "These people." do not accept the validity and legitimacy of Vatican II with regard to liturgical form. Therefore, they don't get it. Take away that treat. No cookie for you. That's a problem. Now, also, just think of tiny things. Like, for example, Sacrosanta Concilium abrogates in the divine office the office of prime which goes all the way back to St. Benedict and before. Well, if you're a member of Institute of Christ the King or FSSP, SI St. Pius X, or even if you just pray the old breviary. And by the way, this monoproprio does not touch the breviary. That's an important uh, distinction. I would say, well, I think it's illegitimate for Vatican II to abrogate prime, the office of prime. The office of prime is, is the first office said in the morning after matins and lauds. I think that's illegitimate. Does that mean that the bishop could then say Taylor Marshall and his people, they can't have a mass? Number two is to designate one or more locations where the faithful adherents of these groups may gather for the Eucharistic celebration, not, however, in the parochial churches and without the erection of new personal parishes. This is a little bit ambiguous, but it says, look, the bishop can say, you can have your rent mass your traditional Latin Mass rent mass at 3 p.m. at this place on the first Sunday, and then on the second Sunday, you're going to be out in the country in this place at 4 p.m., and then on the third Sunday, you're going to be at uh, 6 a.m. out at this parish. But then it says, not in the parochial churches. So where are they going to be? In a tent? I don't understand what this means. We're going to need some interpretation on this. And then it says, and without the erection of new personal parishes. That means you can't erect, apparently, you can't establish a new parish that's exclusive traditional Latin Mass. A personal parish is a parish that instead of being geographical, it's personal in that it brings together persons for a common cause. In this case, the traditional Latin Mass. That just got obliterated. Number two. Number three. The schedule for the traditional Latin Mass of 62, the days and the times have to be established by the bishop. And readings are to be proclaimed in the vernacular. This is a problem. Why? 
Some people don't know this. They think, well, I mean, let's just have the readings in vernacular. Usually, by the way, at a fraternity of St. Peter, Institute of Christ the King, uh, Society of St. Pius X, diocesan, the epistle and gospel will be read or chanted in a high mass or solemn high mass in Latin. And then as the priest gets up into the pulpit before he preaches, he will read the epistle and the gospel again in English for the benefit of the people. It doesn't always happen on a daily mass or a low mass during the week, but almost always on a Sunday or feast day. I think in my experience going to Latin mass for 11 or so years, I would say 97% of the time you hear on a Sunday the, the lessons in, in English again. Here, they're to be proclaimed in the vernacular. And you may think that's not a big deal, but here's why it is a big deal. The epistle and the gospel and any other lessons inside the Mass are actually offered in uh, expiation for souls and for salvation. So, for example, when a subdeacon is ordained in the traditional Roman rite, the bishop says to proclaim the epistle for the living and the dead. When a, a deacon is ordained, it says proclaim the gospel for the living and the dead. He's referring to the liturgical reading because the subdeacon does the epistle and the deacon does the gospel. And when he ordains a priest, he says offer mass for the living and the dead. So each of those three orders has an offering, an oblation that's liturgical in the liturgy. The priest offers mass for the living and the dead. The deacon offers the gospel chant for the living and the dead. And the subdeacon offers the epistle for the living and the dead. Which means that the mass should be in Latin, the gospel should be in Latin, and the epistle should be in Latin. Because it's a performative office for the living and the dead. All right. I suspect that the Fraternity of St. Peter, the Institute of Christ the King, and the Society of St. Pius X will continue to proclaim the epistle and gospel in Latin, hopefully, and resist this draconian canon 3-3. Three, three. Number four, the bishop is to appoint a priest as delegate of the bishop, is entrusted with these celebrations and with the pastoral care of these groups of the faithful. I'm going to pause here. You'll notice it's talking about groups. We're, we're no longer parishes. We're no longer communities. We're just some groups. This priest should be suited for this responsibility, skilled in the use of the Missale Romanum, antecedent to the reform of 1970. This is interesting because actually there was a missal in 1965, though the document refers to 62, so in the context we're referring to the missal of 1962. And this priest must possess a knowledge of the Latin language sufficient for a thorough comprehension of the rubrics and liturgical texts, and be animated by a lively pastoral charity and by a sense of ecclesial communion. This priest should have at heart not only the correct celebration of the liturgy, but also the pastoral and spiritual care of the faithful. Um, I think this is great. I want priests to have to know Latin properly, to be pastoral, uh, to love the people, etc. So I really have no problem with this. I can see this being used, though, by a bishop saying, well, how many years of Latin did you have? That's not enough. Or you're rigid. You can't do that. All right, I'm going to delete a little bit of this so there's more room on the screen. Bear with me. We're on number five now. Article Of Article 3, the Dragon Canon is what I'm calling it. All right. Article 3, sub point 5. The bishop to proceed suitably to verify that the parishes canonically erected for the benefit of these faithful are effective for their spiritual growth and determine whether or not to retain them. The most important phrase in this canon is whether or not to retain them. That means the bishop can come to Dallas, Texas and say, well, modern day, the fraternity of St. Peter Parish, I mean, is it really for the benefit of the people and the spiritual growth? Mm, no, it's not. I don't retain it anymore. Boom, gone. Is that what this is saying? What if there is... For example, a parish like Father Heilman, who says a traditional Latin Mass. Or has, for, for example, Father Altman's parish, before he was canceled. The bishop could just say, yeah, I'm going to not retain that anymore. 
Bishop, you can't do that. Well, yes, I can. I've got the dragon canon in Traditione Custodis. Article 3, sub point 5. Deal with it. And then finally, Article 3, sub point 6. To t the bishop to take care not to authorize the establishment of new groups. No more new groups. As of today, the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, no more new groups. Does that mean new parishes? Does that mean um, a group of God, of holy priests come together and they say, hey, we want to have a, a traditional religious order that's dedicated to helping the poor. We want a traditional order dedicated to the divine office and Gregorian chant. We want a traditional order dedicated to exorcism. And the Pope and the bishops say, well, according to Dragon Canon, number three, sub point six, no new groups. Bye. That's why I call this the Dragon Canon. Because when you look through Article 3, you see all this weaponry given to the bishops. They can just say, well, you guys don't accept the legitimacy of Vatican II. No cookie for you. They can say, well, we're going to set the times and the dates in all these weird ways. If you don't like it, no cookie for you. Uh, you have to have the readings and vernacular. And um, your priest only had one year of Latin, even though I'm the bishop and I didn't do anything about that. No cookie for you. This parish isn't helping people with spiritual growth the way I understand it as a Vatican II modernist. No cookie for you. You lose the traditional Latin mass. Ho um, Bishop, Your Excellency, we'd really like to start a new group um, of traditional Latin mass that meets in um, Los Angeles. Well, Dragon Canon of Tradiciona says no new group. So no new groups for you. It's not my, I mean, I can't do anything about it as the bishop. I'm just following the dragon canon of the motu proprio by Pope Francis. It's not my fault. 